An honorable profession is brought to you by Tech for America, an organization dedicated to providing a platform to solve America's toughest public challenges. For more information, visit t4a.org. That's t, the number four, a.org. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports some of the most thoughtful and innovative voices in American politics. Check out NewDealLeaders.org for more information. Today, I'm talking with someone you need to know, Lyrian Gaylor Baird. She's an amazing woman who's running for mayor of Lincoln, Nebraska. For everyone out there who got all revved up to take back the House in 2018 and is ready to win back the presidency in 2020, supporting candidates like Lyrian is how you need to spend 2019. As you will hear from our interview, Lyrian is smart, pragmatic, and totally committed to public service. Listen, and then help us spread the word about our candidacy. Well, today on An Honorable Profession, we have Lyrian Gaylor Baird, who is a council member and mayoral candidate from Lincoln, Nebraska. So, Lyrian, welcome to An Honorable Profession. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. It's nice to be with you. Lyrian and I have known each other for a while now, so it's, it's good to have a friend. I can genuinely say a really, really great person on this podcast. And so I think we have to start with the most obvious question that all of our listeners are dying to hear, which is, uh, where does your name come from? Where did, you haven't where, heard that how, one before? No. How did you get that name? <laughs> It is a family name that started um, way back. My grandparents had good friends, and and a good friend named Lyrian, whose father was a language professor. It's the ancient Greek word for lily. So there are three of us in my family, and I am very excited to report that I now know of someone who isn't in my family who has this name. I recently developed a friendship on Instagram with another Lyrian who lives in New Jersey and is a horticulturalist, right? Connecting people. Wow, she really took the name and went uh, yeah, she built went, a career around exactly. it. Exactly. Wow, amazing. She actually works at Trump's golf course in New Jersey and does all the flowers and recently decorated at the White House. So she is quite a talented horticulturalist, I might add. It is a very, very small world. So we've had council members on here and mayors on here who have grown up in communities and then went on to serve. We've had people who've grown up and then left and then come back to their hometowns to run for office. But you really chose your community. Uh, you are you are, uh, currently serve in Lincoln, but you're not from Lincoln. Tell me a little bit about your life path that, that led you to Lincoln, Nebraska. Love really took me to Nebraska. My husband is a, is a cornbread Nebraska boy, and we met in college. And when we decided to start our family, we wanted to live in a place close to family with good schools and a safe environment and with lots of opportunity. And so we chose Lincoln as a place to raise our kids. And we now have three, who two are in high school and one's in fifth grade. And now tell me a little bit, because uh, you went to uh, Yale undergrad and uh, then over to Oxford. Uh, so you have a pedigree and then you've worked in San Francisco and New York and D.C. and other places. But so for the, the coastal elites of us who are out listening, tell us about life in Lincoln and why you love it. You know, the real luxury of living in Lincoln is time for one another. It's one of the things I treasure about my community. You have time for your neighbors. When I've lived in bigger cities and spent a lot of time in the car commuting to work or not seeing people because they lived across a bridge and it just the traffic took, you know, meant you just wouldn't see them for more than, I don't know, three months at a time. In Lincoln, I know my neighbors and they know me and we look out for one another. I'll never forget a snowstorm where one of my neighbors came over and delivered some baked goods to my kids because we had enjoyed some of them recently and called and left a voicemail saying how much we liked them. So she baked more and brought them over despite the snowdrift. Or my neighbors who who shovel the driveway for their elderly neighbors. It's it's a place where people look out for each other. You're not as anonymous, and having those relationships and um, just the care and the time to spend 
with our children after work. It makes it a real um, rich existence for uh, just about everybody. That's that's a great story. And so, and Lincoln is also a college town, and it also gives you an opportunity to try out innovative things in government. Uh, how have you been able to engage and have you know Lincoln be on the forefront of some civic issues? Well, it's a wonderful place to get involved because um, there are so many opportunities. And like many people who get involved in government, I started off as a volunteer. I was appointed to the Planning Commission. Uh, it's where I, I got to learn more about city growth and how to promote it and how to think long term about how to grow your city in smart and sustainable ways. And so um, th- that led to the city council and, uh, and running and, and modeling public service for my kids and now running for mayor. Um, so it's, it's been a, a really amazing place to feel like anything is possible, that if you want to give it a go, there are people who support you. Um, you it's a real collaborative community, and um, I, I feel very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to get so involved. Um, because we depend on that. In, in Lincoln, you know, there are so many partnerships, public and private partnerships, and with the philanthropic sector as well. Uh, the, the government isn't getting everything done. It's, it's like these collaborative efforts that really make things happen in Lincoln. And tell me about that first decision to run, because uh, people get involved and they serve on boards or they, or they even serve on city commissions, but it always seems like a big leap to run for office for the first time. And you ran at large, so you ran citywide. Tell me that experience. Well, it was, of course, something I hadn't actually contemplated all my life. Some, you know, some people, I guess, have those kind of dreams and ambitions, but it wasn't something that was on on my radar. I was sort of always interested in good policy and how you promote equity and fairness, especially as a way of um, preventing poverty on the front end. How do you provide great educational opportunities for all our kids? And I had worked for the Boys and Girls Club and in other nonprofits with that goal in mind. But after being on the Planning Commission and, and learning about the, the thoughtfulness that's required to really grow a city in um, great ways and being encouraged by other people who were familiar with my work, um, gave it a go. I mean, it was something that was, like I said, daunting, but I wanted to model public service for my children. And at the time, there was only one woman on city council and she was retiring. So I wanted my kids, both my, my daughters for sure, but also my son, to look up at the, at the dais and, and not just see men behind the microphone. So that was a personal motivating factor for me as well, was to try and make a difference. So tell me, how have your kids appreciated or not appreciated uh, your public service? I will say my dad ran for city council when I was in high school. I very much underappreciated it at the time. Now I'm very obviously very grateful and I've followed uh, in his footsteps. But tell me about what your kids you know, think about your service and your pending mayoral run. I suspect I'll know more about what they think uh, when they're a lot older. Uh, I'm not sure they thought a lot about it the first time um, on election night. They got in kind of a squabble, and one of my, my daughter's glasses broke, and we were supposed to be going down to the big reception where we were celebrating the victory, and, and we were trying to tape my daughter's glasses back together. <laughs> um, so so they missed me when I first started because uh, I was gone more. And, you know, when you are in elected office, people want to have your time. And they deserve your time. You represent them. You need to understand concerns. And a lot of that time is after school. It's in the evening hours. But now that I'm running for mayor, uh, they they are definitely excited. And I was trying to understand maybe a little more about it, why. And I was asking my 14-year-old son. And uh, he let me know that he was pretty excited to be able to tell people, should I win, that the mayor makes him breakfast. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And probably does laundry and all uh, kinds of other right, things around the house. Right. Now, remember, you can always uh, proclaim a day for your kids uh, if they if you get elected. You're giving them more reasons yes, to want this. That's a, that's a, that's a big benefit uh, for, for anyone, but especially for kids. Hey, a quick announcement. We're taking this podcast on the road. We will be live at the TomTom Civic Innovation Festival in Charlottesville, Virginia on April 10th. I'll be talking to some really cool mayors. Please join us. For more information, visit tomtomfest.org. Now, back to my interview with Lyrian. So that first run, going out, knocking on doors, raising money, doing the things you have to do, was there any part that was different than what you expected or harder than you expected or even easier than you expected? Well, 
as you might expect with my name, it was very hard for people to grasp what the heck my name was, especially Leary and Gaylor Baird. All three of them are hard. Uh, and many people didn't know if I was a woman or a man. So just trying to help people recognize who I was was a challenge uh, as a newcomer. And that's so much of what makes uh, politics daunting and difficult is is the familiarity that you need in order to be elected. So it was a lot of time knocking doors, making calls. And one of the things that I really appreciated uh, was how responsive women were to my candidacy. And uh, I really, you know, both sides of the aisle. For me, what was impressive was how little partisanship in this, it was a nonpartisan race, but how little partisanship entered into it for the women voters with whom I spoke. I really was grateful to them, Republican women, nonpartisan, independent women, and Democratic women. Um, they really helped me uh, get where I am today. And that's one of the interesting things is so, you know, most urban areas, most cities, it's all Democrats and shades of Democrats uh, battling with each other on city councils. But uh, Lincoln is legitimately split. So you've had to work across the aisle uh, and find collaborators. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and trying to to have a bipartisan, even though it's a nonpartisan office, a bipartisan approach um, to governing? Yeah, I think it's really important to find the common ground. And I was lucky enough to work with someone uh, on the other side of the aisle who felt the same way. And together, uh, one of my council colleagues and I got past a uh, an open data initiative and drew inspiration for that. We both had been looking into it. I had been inspired by my affiliation with the New Deal, an organization of pro-growth progressive leaders across the country who are interested in innovating and making the economy work for all Americans. And having been exposed to what was going on in other cities like Louisville or South Bend, Indiana, I wanted to see how I might apply those in a Lincoln setting. When I found out my colleague was also interested in the topic, we sat down literally side by side at my desk and started marking up you know, copies of a resolution and drafting the language and expressing the values that we were trying to promote, transparency in government, um, the ability for entrepreneurs to take public data and do something creative and interesting with it. We had a lot of fun together, and I think it's just so important for the public, not only for the results, but to see people from different political parties working together, it's part of what helps keep the faith uh, in our in our democratic experiment in America. It's yeah, it's sad that 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 it almost seems uh, like a novelty uh, as we we're sitting in Washington D.C. right now uh, with the dysfunction. But the idea that Democrat and Republican would roll up their sleeves and work on a policy to improve their community. Um, it's a good. It's good to remember that it still happens. Happens more often at the local level, but uh, but it's a it's it's a good reminder that it's all possible. And it creates an enduring relationship because when you work together and you become better friends, it's more likely to continue to happen. So, how as you look at running for mayor, you know, what do you see as the future for your city? We're in a time of major political upheaval, economic upheaval. How, how do you guide Lincoln through that uh, for the, in the coming years? Lincoln's a pretty solid, stable place. We've weathered a lot of economic uh, turbulent times in, in a, maybe a more um, stable fashion than a lot of other cities. But that doesn't mean we don't have challenges. And I think as we've spent the last decade really focused on um, downtown, sort of the economic engine of our community. I think for the future, we're going to need to look at expanding that, you know, sort of development and revitalization beyond the borders of downtown. We're starting to do that already, but to continue to to move out to the far reaches of um, each corner of the city, that's going to be an important focus. We're also dealing with some of the I guess the uh, consequences of our success. We are starting to see more competition for housing. People want to live in Lincoln. They want to stay in Lincoln or move here. So so we're going to have to make sure that we're conscious about the kinds of thoughtful policies around housing that will make sure that it's affordable for all of our residents. Uh, and, and, of course, just the challenges with growth in general of keeping pace with it, whether it's growing the, the emergency services uh, or keeping up the roads and maintaining the parks and trails that give us a great quality of life. That's Those are really the challenges that we're looking at for the next few years. Yeah, those are big challenges. Are you seeing an influx of sort of alums looking to come back uh, as they as they retire or maybe even as they start families? Yeah, I think that a lot of young people who maybe wouldn't have considered staying and were ready to just jet right after college are now 
facing a difficult choice. They might have an opportunity in a bigger city, but they look around Lincoln and they see, you know, the new arena, new cultural offerings, more concerts, better food and restaurant opportunities. And um, and they're thinking, this is really a tough quality of life to give up because you certainly can't get it in a more expensive big city. And so Lincoln's a, uh, a blue or purple dot uh, in the middle of a red state. Tell me about how the city interacts with the state uh, when you're trying to address some of these policies. Some of these policies can be addressed at the local level, but some require cooperation um, across different levels of government. You know, we try to have great relationships with state senators. Um, we certainly are impacted by decisions they make, and um, the city works with um, our, our local delegation, of course, and tries to make clear our priorities. We have a very interesting setup in Nebraska. We have what's a, called the unicameral, so we don't have two houses of, of government at the state level. We have one, and they are a nonpartisan body, and that has its benefits. You know, Nebraska likes to pride itself on its independence, and I think that's worked to our advantage uh, over, over the years. Now, I ask, uh, I ask this of a lot of folks uh, because I think it's good for folks, for people who are listening who haven't been in elective office to get a sense of it. But like, tell me about like your best day in office and tell me about your worst day in office and sort of, you know, what, what, what you learned from it. My best day in office? Oh, my goodness. Um, here's my best day in office. It was really recently, actually. Uh, there was... A a resolution before the council to not make some improvements to a particular stretch of road that ran through a core neighborhood. And a bunch of neighborhood residents came down and testified. People we'd never even heard from before. People were motivated to come in through the efforts of a lot of advocacy and collective impact work. And those residents changed the minds of the council there the public hearing worked just as it's supposed to there was a direction that we were headed um, that was being proposed people came in and spoke their minds their voices were heard and in the end the person who had sponsored the legislation voted against it and we we did not follow his course of action we um we followed what the neighborhood residents wanted and I think those people felt victory on many levels. Uh, one, they got the result they want, but they got they they got heard, and these were people who had never even necessarily contacted the council before, including many who wrote in postcards um, in Spanish that were translated for us. So we were expanding kind of the the reach um, of of voices in our community, and that was a beautiful day in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's a great day. Has there been any bad days? Well, tough in my line of work to, <laughs> to, to really truthfully say uh, no. Um, bad days. I mean, bad days when when we really can't find the common ground or can't the, when there's an unwillingness to compromise among some in the body. Uh, that that was tough. There um, there was a time where the council majority um, of which I was not a part. Um, did, just chose not to fulfill a required duty, and and the mayor was forced to sue the city council to fulfill its obligation. And of course, the courts agreed with, with the council minority and the and the mayor. And and uh, that's the situation you don't want to be in. But um, I, as far as really, I think the thing that's just more on a personal level, what's hard, I'd say that. Uh, the worst day is when I can't solve someone's problem. When someone reaches out and they want help, and I try, but I can't get what they need, whether it's because there's a regulation or it's not actually a city issue or um, there's just it's not possible for some reason. But the beautiful thing I've witnessed in some of those situations is that often people say thank you anyway. That's been the most surprising thing about being a city council member is when you you try to help, you can't get what they, the result they want, and they still express gratitude because you tried and because someone listened. That to me is one of the most beautiful things about working in local government. That's a great um, that's a great observation. It's so yeah, I mean, tell me, there's a lot of people who are giving up hope in politics, in maybe even democracy, in recent polls. Um, but and you could be with your background, you could be doing essentially anything you want with your time. You could be working for Fortune 500 companies, which you've done. You could be working as a you know in state government. You could be doing any number of things. But you've chosen to serve your community uh, uh, through city council and hopefully mayor. What gives you hope to keep 
grinding away because it's not always positive. There's times when people don't say thank you. Uh, there's long nights. Uh, and so what, what, makes you, what makes you optimistic or what makes you keep going? Well, one of the things I love about working in local government is that I feel like we are increasingly, as cities, these hubs of innovation and experimentation. And when you see all the gridlock and the frustrations at the federal level, you can turn away from that and look to the local level and see a lot of more uh, fertile common ground. You get to vote on things, get them done for your community, go out and see them implemented in a pretty short time frame. And when you really are getting things done that affect the community and make it a better place, whether it's developing new housing, whether it's fixing um, playground equipment, whether it's building new fire stations and joint police fire stations so that you have better emergency response in a growing community. It just feels like you're being useful. And I, that's why I want to do this job for now is as long as I can be of use, I think it's a great thing to do. And I hope that I will be able to help bring other people along by setting a, a good example, because it isn't something I want to be in forever. I want the next generation of folks to come in and take my place with new ideas eventually. So um, I have an eye on the future um, and an eye on the present. I'm trying not to look back too much unless I can learn good, ex- good lessons from the past. And it's exciting and dynamic and for right now um, a fruitful place to be. Thank you. It makes me want to move to Lincoln and you live, should come visit. live under your leadership. <laughs> um, so uh, so Thank your you. Your city needs you. <laughs> yes, I know. I, 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 um, you have a, you do have a better football team than my, uh, than Santa Cruz does. And an amazing volleyball team, I have to say. There. Husker volleyball champions of the country. There you go. Go, go Huskers. Um, so thank you, Lirian, for joining us today. Thank you for your uh, leadership in Nebraska. And then also for, uh, for sharing the joys of life in Lincoln uh, with the rest of us. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcast. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we're keeping this honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. And hey, do me a favor. Please tell your friends about An Honorable Profession and Reyes and Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. It makes a big difference both this podcast and the leaders we talk to.